Defund. Defund. Defund it. Defunding. Defund the police. Defund the police. How did it come to this? It happened with Vietnam. It is happening today. Officers opening fire on an unarmed black man. Breonna Taylor shot and killed by Louisville police officers. The shooting death of Walter Wallace Jr. The officer Dean shot and killed 28-year-old Atatiana Jefferson. Why does it take us seeing and hearing unnecessary death and suffering to understand? Defunding police isn't simply reducing budgets or the size of the force by an arbitrary number. We are not looking for a number. We are looking for change. We want to change the system to serve our lives rather than end them. It's about reducing government intervention redirecting resources to serve the community. Authentic accountability where officers and departments fail to protect the communities they serve. Not just in big cities, but everywhere across the country and in the state of Washington, which is why statewide solutions to change policing are critical. This year, the people of Washington State stand poised to lead the nation in creating systems of transparent police accountability and anti-racist statewide alternatives to a police response when a community member needs help. Lawmakers across Washington State are working to pass laws in 2021 to protect and liberate Black lives from police brutality and create community-driven solutions that serve all Washingtonians. Defunding, divesting, and reinvesting to align with the values of the people is nothing new. Black liberation is a mandate of the people. For Washington State, the time is now. Well, can we just take a moment and the impact of that video was was a lot for me, excuse me. And I hope, (sighs) sorry. Um, Welcome everyone. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, We are here on, we would like to acknowledge that we are on Duwamish territory and native land. Indigenous people have stewarded this land and we want to make sure that we acknowledge in waterways for thousands of years. And we want to recognize that these lands were occupied that we're on today are stolen. We also want to recognize the black lives that have been stolen on these lands as well. Good evening, everyone. I am Deontay Damper. I'm a member of the Black Lives Matter Alliance Steering Committee, a statewide coalition that grew from hundreds to thousands of people that took to the streets this summer to say, Black Lives Matter. Our protection, our liberation is a mandate for the people. And we're moving the power and the protest this year forward to Olympia. Black people, indigenous people, and people of color have been systematically and historically excluded from from political processes, and everything else, but this is a time where we are not doing that anymore. At this point, what what BLM Alliance Steering Committee is doing, we're not asking for a seat at the table. We, we community, we're building our own and everyone's watching and we're doing this, as, we're doing this work for you. We're doing this work for, for us. And we're not just talking about just Black Lives Matter. We're talking about all of black life. We're more than just the pulse. The nation's clear, clearly has been woken by police tactics this year. And our agenda is our agenda today is just to continue to have key, key pillar focuses with black equality and <clears throat> excuse me, black equity and criminal justice. 
Tonight, um, as of many other nights that'll happen, we will be focusing on police tactics and accountability specifically. I now pass it to Sakara Ramos. Thank you, Deontay. For the Washington Black Lives Matter Alliance, our equity and criminal justice priorities are as follows. Protect and invest in Black expression, arts and culture. Create police accountability for Black and IPOC communities and Black disparities in drug sentencing and decriminalize low-level drug charges. Restore voting rights for incarcerated persons in Washington state. End transgender discrimination and, under, and other gender or race impacted bias crimes. End youth incarceration and close nacelle in 2021. End money bail and pretrial detention in Washington state. End mandatory minimum sentencing ensure vaccine availability as a priority in private prisons, protect and care for health needs of incarcerated persons, particularly in this time, and eradicate private prisons from Washington state. With us this evening, we have a panel of folks to discuss some of these issues with you. We only have an hour, it's going to go quick. We don't have time to talk about everything, but particularly with what we see happening in the nation right now, it's more important than ever that we remain unbent, undaunted, and fighting for the protection and liberation for Black lives. So I'm honored to um, welcome you all and welcome our panel. And I'm going to be doing a lot of talking and reading here about our guests. Again, I'm Sakara Raymu. I use she, her pronouns. With us this evening is Livio De La Cruz. Livio is a board member of Black Lives Matter Seattle King County. He was born in the Dominican Republican, but grew up in various states across the country before moving to Seattle in 2014. He's a founding member of Black Lives Matter Seattle King County, which started in 2018. He's currently a student at Seattle University School of Law and Livio serves on the Governor's Task Force on Independent Investigations of Police Use of Force and was integral in the passage and the work to get I-940 and its implementation into law. Representative Jesse Johnson represents the 30th District. Jesse Johnson is a lifelong Federal Way resident and a graduate from the University of Washington. The son of a Navy veteran and a commercial residential painter, Johnson was the youngest city council member in federal way history, A. South King, when he first took office at the age of 27. Now he serves as one of the legislature's youngest members where he works to help working families and seniors struggling with high costs, students looking for the right pathways to a good paying job, and families struggling with housing insecurity across the state. Representative Johnson's values are rooted in equity, inclusion, and social justice. His focus comes from his close partnership with community in South King, where he also works in workforce planning and development for the Highline School District. His passion for education and youth development comes from his own lived experiences growing up in Federal Way, where he apprenticed with his father at a painting and general contracting company. Addressing youth violence prevention and expanding behavioral health services are important issues for Representative Johnson, stemming from the work he championed on the Federal Way City Council. He also looks to address housing stability, needs for veterans in his community, and fostering entrepreneurial spirit and small business ownership. Representative Johnson lives in Federal Way with his wife, who is a University of Washington medical student. He serves as vice chair of public safety. He is on the appropriations committee, as well as the committee for community and economic development. Representative Johnson is bringing a significant bill, HB 1054, establishing requirements for tactics and equipment used by peace officers. The bill would limit the usage of police dogs, tear gas, concealment of badge numbers, and military equipment, among other things. 
Representative Johnson, thank you for being with us. Senator Menka Dingra represents the 45th district. She is the majority leader of the Washington State Senate. She was first elected to the Senate by the constituents of the 41st legislative, 45th Legislative District in November 2017, the first Sikh legislator elected in the nation. Since then, she has sponsored and passed legislation addressing a wide range of issue areas, including curbing domestic violence and sexual assault, preventing firearm violence, providing property tax relief for seniors and people with disabilities, prosecuting financial fraud, and reforming the criminal justice system with an evidence-based approach. During her time in the Senate, Senator Dingra has helped pass legislation and funding to transform the Washington State behavioral health system, reorienting it around prevention rather than crisis response. She continues to strive to ensure that Washingtonians with behavioral health needs get the treatment they need and deserve. As a member of the Special Committee on Economic Recovery, she is helping the state craft an economic plan to lead an equitable recovery from the COVID-19 economic downturn, which disproportionately impacts Black people and other people of color. She also serves on several task forces dedicated to reducing poverty, reforming the criminal justice system, improving equity in state government, and providing a sound and fair fiscal footing for the state. Senator Dingra is a community leader, an anti-domestic violence advocate on the East Side, she co-founded Chaya, an organization that assists South Asian survivors on domestic violence and led the organization's work to end systemic violence through education and prevention. She also serves on the board of the National Alliance on Mental Illness East Side. She brings two decades of experience as a prosecutor and behavioral health expert to her roles as chair of the Senate Behavioral Health Subcommittee and vice chair of the Senate Law and Justice Committee. She also serves on the Ways and Means Committee. Senator Dingra has a number of bills that I'm about to tell you about. SB 5035, concerning offender scoring of drug offenses. So important. The bill would prohibit the use of past transgressions if they occurred 10 years ago in determining a sentencing score. SB 5036, concerning Conditional communication by the Clemencing and Pardoning Board. The bill would use an equity lens for representation on the Clemency and Pardons Board and also commute sentences for eligible offenders. SB 5066, relating to a peace officer's duty to intervene. A police officer who witnesses another officer engaging or attempting to engage in the excessive use of force would have a duty to intervene to prevent such actions. Excessive force means force that exceeds the degree of force permitted by law or policy, which is what Representative Johnson's bill is working to address. SB 5067 requires the Washington Association of Prosecuting Attorneys to update its best practices policy addressing potential impeachment disclosures. That's Greek to a lot of people. It will make sense of why this is important. SB 5069 relating to the compliance and transparency of deadly force investigations. The bill empowers the state auditor to review deadly force investigations and the criminal justice training center to request an audit of any state law enforcement agency. SB 5071 relating to creating transition terms to assist specified persons under civil commitment, the bill would offer additional support, including social and mental health services. SB 5073, relating to improving involuntary commitment laws, the bill would require a crisis response to determine if an individual has a mental health advance directive. Thank you, Senator Dingra, for being with us. You're welcome. Last but not least, Senator Jamie Peterson, who represents the 43rd District. Senator Peterson grew up in Puyallup, graduated from Puyallup High School, and worked at McDonald's to help put himself through Yale College, where he studied Russian history and graduated summa cum laude. 
After spending a year living in Russia and collecting oral histories of Soviet Afghan war veterans, he attended Yale Law. He clerked on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit and then returned to Seattle and Capitol Hill in 1995. He practiced corporate law oh, at Preston Gates and Ellis for 17 years. Since May 2012, he has been vice president and general counsel at McKinstry, a Seattle-based construction and engineering firm with substantial expertise in green building. Senator Peterson was elected to the House of Representatives in 2006 and was appointed to the Senate in December 2013 and elected in 2014 and 2018. Senator Peterson chaired the board of the National Civil Rights Organization, Lambda Legal, and served as Lambda's lead volunteer lawyer on the state's marriage equality case. He serves as the chair of the Law and Justice Committee and also serves on the Ways and Means Committee, the Early Learning and K-12 Education Committee, and the Rules Committee. In the House, he served for five years as the chair of the House Judiciary Committee. Senator Peterson is working on SB 5051 concerning state oversight and accountability of peace officers and corrections officers. The bill would establish a statewide authority to hold police and correction officers accountable for excessive force violations of the law. Senator Peterson, thank you for being with us. With that, I turn it back over to Deontay. Sakar, I just wanted you to start over. You did such a great job. Everybody was amazing. Um, so happy to be here today with the three, with, with you four panelists. I think I'm going to start with. Um, uh, I think I'll start it off with Livio. Um, what is the current state of policing taxit, tactics and accountability in the state of Washington? Hi, thank you for that. So many of you will remember Initiative 940, which was on the yeah. ballot during 2018, uh, and that did pass. It passed with 60% of the vote. Uh, 940 was notable for a few reasons. It, many of you remember as a de-escalate bill. It required mandatory training for de-escalation tactics and also first aid, and, it, it re and that's relevant because it required officers to apply first aid after shooting someone. But most people remember it as the bill that changed the use of force standard in Washington. Before then, the and it was nearly impossible to convict a police officer of homicide under Washington law. And so 940 made that standard less difficult to overcome. Uh, it, and 940 also required independent investigations. However, it did not define how to do that. <laughs> uh, it was the the ultimate rules that defined what how to conduct independent investigations were laid out in the rulemaking process. So as opposed to 940 was enshrined into statutory law, then there's the, the regulations on top of that law, which are in the WAC, the Washington Administrative Code. And so that's where the determination was made on how the process would work. And as we can, as I can talk a bit more, <laughs> there's there's a lot of gaps with respect to how that's done, and that eventually. So, as I was introduced, I was uh, appointed to the governor's task force on independent investigations. The purpose of which was to address those gaps. Um, would you like me to explain the task force a bit? Just just a tad, please. That was my <laughs> yes. So the task force. Uh, the full name of it is the Governor's Task Force on Independent Investigations of Police Use of Force. <laughs> it was a, created this summer and we, we've we technically finished our work already, but I say technically because it's just on paper. We're still, we're all still working on this and particularly the bills that have come out of it. Uh, so like I said, the purpose of the task force was to fill in these gaps, but to determine how to fill it in. So the task force is made up of about two dozen community members, impacted family members, activists, and some cops. Um, and together we studied the issue. We looked at what different jurisdictions have done. Uh, we looked outside of the United States. We, were, we met for months and the ultimate, and so what we produced, we produced recommendations. So we don't necessarily 
draft a bill ourselves, but we produce recommendations and then the governor's office has drafted a bill or they are currently drafting. It, it's, they're almost done basically. <laughs> and they're gonna, so the governor is gonna introduce this bill in session, which, which embodies part of our recommendations. And uh, there's another bill that embodies the rest of our recommendations. <laughs> uh, so, th uh, and neither of these bills have numbers as far as I know. I might be out of date, but they don't. Uh, so the ultimate recommendations that we made was we are asking for a new, the creation of a new statewide agency uh, that will be dedicated solely to the work of investigating police officers who have committed homicide. And this, and very key, uh, the agency is prohibited from hiring former law enforcement. The whole idea is that law enforcement have an inherent conflict of interest when investigating each other. There is, it's a bias that colors how reasonable they think certain actions are, where the whole experience of the BLM movement has been us insisting that no, such conduct was totally unreasonable and uncalled for. Uh, right. So, however, to build the expertise needed to con to do this work, investigative work, the agency is permitted to allow, according to our recommendations, permitted to allow uh, hiring former law enforcement within the first five years of its work. Um, and then the, the second major component of our recommendations is the requirement of a special prosecutor because local prosecutors are notoriously biased in favor of law enforcement. Uh, we saw that with the the one charge that was filed against uh, an officer since the enactment of 940, that the prosecutor's office <laughs> really just, uh, the prosecutors are notorious for asking for the most harsh uh, requirements and the most harsh uh, penalties. And when they brought those charges, they're uncharacteristically lenient against the officer uh, when asking, when setting bail, for example. And it's it's notorious how much bias there is among prosecutors. We basically think of prosecutors as law enforcement for the purposes of independence. Uh, and so that's, the prosecution piece is captured in another bill that uh, Senator uh, Representative Entman is working on. Okay, well, that can't wait to hear that from her. Shout out to Ms. Entman. Um, uh, Mr. Mr. Representative Johnson, um, same question. Can you repeat the question? Sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what is your what is the current state of uh, policing tactics and accountability? What does that look like in the state of Washington? Well, I, I want to begin by saying I think the vast majority of our officers do their job with honor and with respect to the profession. Um, but we know that systemic racism exists across all of our institutions, and that includes law enforcement. And uh, right now, when we look across our state, you know, I believe that there's still a dominant military culture within modern police agencies in our state. And so we want, we want to make sure that we're addressing uh, standards and accountability and transparency so that we don't have um, issues of police violence that will then uh, make the entire profession look bad. And so I think in our state, um, we are maybe more progressive than other states. However, um, we still need a lot of change. And I think we're kind of at a fork in the road when we're looking at our system right now, looking at police um, tactics, looking at accountability, obviously decertification, uh, data collection. And it's, it's our job as elected officials to bring forth uh, policies that are going to make the profession better. So, um, you know, for me, I'm really examining the ways we've perpetuated racial inequity within the system of law enforcement. I think that's why I decided to focus on the police tactics bill because it's really getting to the core of preserving and protecting human life, which I believe is the most fundamental value of our law enforcement system. And currently some of the tactics that we use in law enforcement do not uphold that value in my mind. So this bill will set a baseline standard for acceptable tactics and equipment that can be used. But again, it goes back to how do we make sure that there's increased accountability and transparency in the process and in the profession so that officers can do their job and community feel safe? Absolutely. It's about safety. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Senator Dingra. 
Thank you. Um, I just want to first start off by saying that I echo your sentiments about the video. I, I had like goosebumps on my arms watching it. So thank you to whoever put that uh, together. It it really was so powerful. Um, now back to build. Um, so the three specific builds around police accountability that were mentioned, um, they actually fit in that whole scheme of bills that we're talking about and actually tie in very closely with the bill that Senator Peterson um, sponsored. And they really are about empowering the law enforcement officers who are doing the right things and want to hold themselves up to a high ethical standard to be able to intervene and report their fo fellow officers who are not holding themselves up to that high standard that we expect of all of them. Um, I think it is uh, it's supposed to be a privilege and an honor for an individual to be a law enforcement officer. They've been given this immense power to enforce the laws of our state and carry a weapon. And with that sense of responsibility, I think it's absolutely acceptable for us to, re to require a high sense of ethical obligation. And so the duty to uh, intervene and a duty to report is very much in the same vein. So we want our officers to be able to step in, stop, wrongdoing from occurring. If uh, they're not able to step in to, to uh, stop it, they do have a requirement to report regardless. And so really making sure that we are becoming aware of incidents either when they are about to happen, before they happen, or even after they happen. That then ties in to where they report it, reporting it to the CJTC so that uh, Senator Peterson's bill can go into effect and uh, reporting it to the local prosecuting attorney's office. And that goes to the potential impeachment disclosure bill, which is a technical bill, but prosecutors have an ethical responsibility to disclose um, any uh, evidence they have of any veracity issues about their witnesses, especially law enforcement officers. So requiring that disclosure to go to the prosecutor's office is key because their bar license is um, at stake if they don't disclose that information. So standardizing what that looks like, requiring that that be reported within 10 days, uh, also requiring that if an officer uh, changes jobs, the new law enforcement agency must uh, reach out to the other prosecutor to find out whether or not this officer was on the potential impeachment disclosure list. So um, those bills work together again to make sure that no one is slipping through the cracks. The audit bill is actually something that was left over from the I-940 um, initiative. You know, you can have all these great policies and procedures in place, but if you don't have someone just kind of doing a check, you know, take a, you know, go through after everything's done, go through and make sure that everything went the way we intended for it to go. Do a little checklist, make sure everyone dotted their I's and crossed their T's. And that gives us really, as community members, as legislators, a really good check to see, are the laws and policies working in the manner in which we intended? And if they're not, then we have the opportunity to make those changes. We're at least getting data back on um, what is being done. The auditing process um, also gives the Criminal Justice Training Commission the ability to request an audit on any agency, regardless of a deadly force incident. This is if, any, if the uh, commission feels that that agency is not meeting its requirements on training, on protocol, they can ask for that audit. So again, it's about making sure that there are eyes uh, on the process that are taking a look um, at issues. And um, um, Sakara did such a great job with my introduction. I would love to take her with me everywhere I go so she can keep introducing me. But I do have other criminal justice bills as well. Uh, criminal justice reform is something I'm very passionate about. And I'm happy to talk about those at um, any other time. But those three are the police accountability bills. Right. So thank you very much. Um, and um, S uh, Senator Peterson, sorry. No, thank you. Um, you know, hey, first, the thing that I guess I'd like to reflect on in terms of context is how fortunate we are to have both Senator Dingra and Representative Johnson here in the legislature and engaged in this work. And what a contrast that is to how our, the face of our legislature uh, 14 years ago when I started, um, you know, you're hearing both their passion, their engagement, uh, and their technical expertise that they're bringing to mm -hmm. making significant change in this area. I just feel very lucky to be working with them. 
Uh, I think the other thing that's happened this year uh, as the attention of everyone has been drawn to um, the killings of black people, particularly by police across the country, is that um, we've had just an, an unprecedented level of cooperation and collaboration between House and Senate Democrats and the governor's office uh, over the last six or seven months, getting ready for the session and preparing a, a large number of bills that together, I think, are going to work as a package to make a real difference in terms of accountability. So, you know, going back to your question about where, what about the state of accountability currently, clearly I-940 was a significant step forward for us from a uniquely bad standard requiring prosecutors to prove actual malice by a police officer before there could be any criminal accountability. But um, <laughs> we're a long way from having the kind of accountability for misbehavior that we need in the system. Um, one example of that is that officers who abuse the public trust right now have the ability to go through a long set of administrative and other appeals uh, with their agency employers. And if it looks like things are going to go badly for them, they can resign in lieu of discipline, walk right down the street from Renton to Kent or Auburn and get a job at another department uh, without really much scrutiny and without any consequences. And we certainly have had some notorious examples of officers who have been repeat uh, offenders at various agencies and just, you know, kind of shocking to see that. So the bill that I'm focusing on, uh, which we call state accountability and oversight, is really one that works in tandem with the bills that Representative Johnson and, Rep and Senator Dingra have been talking about by reforming the Criminal Justice Training Commission and expanding a power that it technically has already, which is to decertify officers. Uh, the problem is that that power is very limited uh, in the way that it can be exercised now. There has to be a final decision by a police agency uh, on discipline against the officer. And only after that can the Criminal Justice Training Commission move to decertify an officer. So this bill would significantly broaden the set of circumstances under which an officer could be decertified. Um, it, it also allows the agency to work as soon as the facts have occurred, uh, potentially to take action against the officer's certification. Uh, it allows some intermediate steps as well. So decertification is not the only kind of discipline. There could be a suspension of a license or mandatory retraining that's imposed on an officer. Um, it changes the makeup of the commission, which is currently dominated by law enforcement, so that it makes it majority community led. Uh, and it changes the makeup of the individual panels that will make the disciplinary decisions so that those are majority non-law enforcement making those decisions uh, about any potential discipline. Uh, and then finally, it, it uh, makes a number of changes regarding the record retention for these disciplinary actions and the reporting obligations of local agencies so that all of that information gets fed into a publicly available database uh, of disciplinary uh, investigations and disciplinary problems that have been raised across the state. Uh, I think in combination with the tactics bill and the use of force bill that Representative Johnson is working on and the duty to intervene and the duty to report that Senator Dingra is working on, this will provide an effective enforcement mechanism that will no longer depend on what local city councils might decide in their collectively bargained agreements with local police unions so that we have effective state oversight and accountability. Uh, for the standards that we're trying to enforce uh, with respect to our law enforcement. Okay, I'll say, amazing. So I, I wanna go to, sorry, every time when you guys have talked, I just wanna, I wanna write these, these policies down, but I'm gonna be able to do that at the end. So <laughs> the second question that I have is, um, how do we start to get solutions within our issues? I, the 
the the four of you all stated um, great things with, within which policy are you working on? Which or do you believe is the solution to these issues, especially when it comes to accountability space? And I think you spoke about that a little bit, you know, yeah. um, but I think one of the things that we really want to get to, like in real plain language is like, seriously, how did we get to this point, you know, and helping people across Washington understand how it is that, and I think Senator Peterson spoke to this a bit, it, it, to say that you've been doing this work for the past six, seven, eight months. And so, and, and speaking about the difference in kind of the historical context of Olympia, who's been there, how things typically run. So how did we get in Washington state to this point where the legislature is working eight months before convening uh, to be prepared to address these kinds of issues. We're not up here in theory, we're down rooted in these laws that permit these kinds of activities. Uh, Representative Johnson, do you have any thoughts on that? I do, I gotta start by just giving a shout out to all the organizers, the civil rights advocates, uh, families of victims impacted by police violence that are working every day as we speak to ensure that we have a comprehensive set of police reform bills across the state because this work started and is ending with them. And now it's just kind of up to us to take the baton across the finish line. But um, from my experience in the last six, seven months, um, I don't wanna speak for Senator Dinger and Senator Peterson, but working closely aligned with those groups has been uh, quite an experience. We've been on weekly calls with the Washington Coalition on Police Accountability I've uh, worked with uh, Washington for Black Lives, um, so many different families and organizers in this work. And, uh, you know, they are the ones that are keeping us going and really um, providing the, uh, not only the insight and the lived experience, but also in partnership with uh, organizers and attorneys, the expertise, the legal expertise. And so we've been working hand in hand with these groups for the past six, seven months. And that's really why we're at this point. And like Senator Peterson mentioned, um, close alignment with the caucuses, both in the Senate and the, the House, with the governor's office as well. Um, I definitely just got to give a lot of, uh, of kudos to, to our organizers across the state of Washington. Um, and then, you know, I think right now, because we are seeing continued uh, violence across our country, um, there's just an, an appetite for um, making sure that we put the policies in place and not turn a blind eye to what's happening across the country. And so I really just believe that we're in a perfect position to get these bills passed for the first time in our state's history. Um, we've partnered and listened and learned from historically marginalized communities and organizations. Um, we've increased community engagement in the process. And now it's really just about the political will to get that passed in the session. But I'm just really excited because this has been grassroots and, and, and really community led. So I'm going yeah. to be a little, little bit more cynical than Representative Johnson, um, and um, and I'll just say, community members, black people, have been telling us for decades that this is going on. We didn't believe them. Non-black people did not believe them. Um, and you know, when I've been working on criminal justice reform issues for so many years, and it was always the same people around the same table. I um, really do believe that because we had COVID, there weren't Hollywood movies coming out, there wasn't a new cycle that was refreshing, you know, every few hours, that finally people took this seriously because there was a video. And that video was not replaced by other news items. Um, and, and it's so unfortunate, so unfortunate that so many people have to die for so many years for this to finally get the attention um, that it needs and it deserves. But the fact that the city of Woodenville, city of Duval, city of Redmond, Kirkland, had huge Black Lives uh, Matter um, rallies was really telling because these are communities that normally do not get involved in criminal justice reform or police accountability right. issues. So, um, so to me, the timing absolutely has to be now because it is not just the same black people, people of color talking about this issue. It is everyone. And um, so I understand we're gonna have 
a tough session ahead of us. We have economic recovery to deal with. We are going to be um, an online session, but this is a time for us to go bold because people are paying attention and they're going to continue to pay attention because there isn't another Hollywood movie, sorry, and Bollywood, Hollywood movie coming out um, next week or the week after. So this is the time and this is when it has to be done. Senator uh, Peterson, I wonder if you would speak, I mean, I'm making an assumption, but I think it's a safe one from a position of an ally and a, from a position of privilege in kind of your own getting to this moment in leading this work. Yeah, I have to tell you, I've done an awful lot of reflecting in the last eight or 10 months about um, about the position that I hold uh, in in the state government, the responsibility that I have, and uh, you know my failure to have used the power that I have to to make the kind of change that we need. Um, I I feel a lot of guilt about not having uh, done enough uh, to make changes, and you know. As we watched the the protests unfold, as we all had our consciences seared by our uh, failure to act to protect people in our community, I, I think it was a real um, sort of moment of clarity for me about the need to change um, to change my focus and to make some different choices about where I was going to uh, put my uh, put my efforts to bear uh, in terms of the legislative work, um, and you know, I, <laughs> I guess true to true to form, I chose an area that to focus on that was very technical, and uh, so my my bills are much longer. My bill that I'm working on is much longer uh, and more sort of inaccessible than Senator Dingra's. I, I love reading her bills; they're often just two pages long and very crisp and easy to follow. Uh, this is a you know 35 40 page bill that's uh, that has a lot of technical stuff in it, but but I do feel like that's an area where um, where I can contribute. And you know, having had a a pretty long history of working on some controversial issues uh, through the process, um, I feel hopeful that that as an ally, I'm going to be able to make a difference in um, uh, in changing the system. Uh, I should also mention that uh, an, another bill that I have not introduced yet, but I'm just about ready to, to drop, uh, is one that's called the Uniform Pretrial Release and Detention Act, which will significantly reform uh, our cash bail system in the state mm -hmm. and create a strong presumption, uh, not only for courts uh, deciding about pretrial release, but also for police uh, initially having contact uh, with folks that people who haven't been convicted of a crime ought to be free unless one of some very specific criteria is met about a flight risk or a danger of violence to another person. Um, and I, I am also hopeful that uh, if we can get that bill across the finish line, that it's going to make a real difference in the way that um, a lot of lives are interrupted by interactions with the police uh, people are separated from their families and from their jobs uh, without ever having been convicted. So, uh, so I, I really, I really do feel um, excited about the opportunity that we have to to bend our laws uh, toward greater equity and justice, and for us to act as anti-racists in the state government. Thank you, Deontay. Yes, um, I was going to go to the third question. Um, and I was going to start with um, <clears throat> Representative Johnson. So what is your call to action your first week of session? For the people. For the people. Sorry. <laughs> well, uh, my call to action is exactly that word, action. Um, I know that Tuesday morning, 8 a.m., uh, we'll be hearing my bill on police tactic in the uh, the House Public Safety Committee. And um, right now it's really bringing the people um, virtually in this digisphere we're in to Olympia to 
uh, testify in support of this bill because we got to get it passed and give the community hope that we can ban things like chokeholds and no-knock warrants that have produced so many negative outcomes. And really, um, our lack of action has cost lives across the country. And so um, I'm really excited to get to work on that bill. I'm also going to be dropping um, the use of force bill that uh, Senator Peterson referred to next week, as well as a community oversight board bill so that uh, by the year 2025, every single jurisdiction with 10 officers or more has to have a community oversight board within the city uh, to partner and to work and to um, make sure that police protocols are community based and localized to fit that community. So yeah. it's really going to work. It's action. Um, I'm excited about um, the work and partnership with the Senate, um, but we got to hear these bills. I know that we're in a long session, but the process moves so quickly. Um, and I'm learning that just in my second session coming up, but it's just, you got to get uh, things together really quickly and, and get folks on board. And so I'm just excited to get to work uh, really uh, Monday afternoon and then Tuesday morning, this bill will be heard. So, um, you know, um, action is, is the word of the day and, and there's no more time for talking. The community has told us what they what we need. And so it's really up to us to get it passed and get it across the finish line. OK, I'm going to write that down. Action. All right. Um, <laughs> Senator Dinga, same same question. You know, um so I am going to uh, quote uh, Monisha here. She's become like my favorite person to quote these days. When she testified in front of the Law and Justice Committee on uh, Police Accountability, um, uh, she said, you know, the year 2020 has given us perfect vision. We can now clearly see all the inequities that exist in our society. And so I take that to the next step. And I say, yes, it has clearly shown us the inequities that exist from the time someone is born with access to health care, education, housing, um, food insecurity. Uh, you know, it, it just goes on and on. And, you know, we're talking about police accountability, but that's all of it. And so my call of action really is that as community leaders, as elected leaders, um, we have this perfect vision now. It is our time to address those inequities. And if you hold a position of power, regardless of whether or not you're an elected, because we all have positions of power, we have to make sure we are taking steps to address this inequity. I, I don't think there's any excuse not to. Amen. Felt like I was in church. Okay, um, Senator Peterson, same question. Yeah, so I think one of the, there are some real downsides about the uh, virtual session that we're about to go into. But one of the real upsides um, is that being a part of the process of making the laws in the legislature is going to be much more accessible to people. They don't have to drive to Olympia by eight in the morning to sign in at an electronic kiosk uh, and then sit in a room waiting around for hours to see whether they might get 30 seconds to testify. Um, People, as soon as the, well, so my my first week agendas went up, I'm not as brave as Representative Johnson and his committee are, so I'm, I'm starting out with some more boring bills in the first week, but week two is gonna be when we start doing uh, a lot of police accountability work. Uh, and then in, in week three, we'll be doing some criminal justice reform um, and uh, gun issues. Uh, so I expect there'll be substantial public interest. As soon as the agenda is posted for a committee hearing this year, it'll be possible for members of the public to go through the legislative website and sign up uh, to testify or just to sign in in support of or in opposition to legislation. And so I encourage people to get used to going to the legislative website and looking at the bills as, they're, as they get scheduled signing in uh, to express support for those. You can provide written testimony if you don't feel comfortable being on Zoom. But I think there's going to be a quantum leap in terms of engagement from our state citizens uh, in this session and a real opportunity to show broad public support for some of the policies that we're talking about. So uh, I really think that is a that is a key lesson that everyone needs to take to heart uh, this year about just very tactical, specific, and consistent engagement, particularly during these first five weeks of the session, which is one of the most of the bills are going to get their initial public hearings in the uh, chamber where they're introduced. Uh, there will be another opportunity a few weeks later when they 
go across the transom, the House bills in the Senate and the Senate bills in the House. But uh, I, I think that would be a huge, uh, a huge service to us and to the state uh, if people can engage consistently in that way. Thank you. Sorry. If you are represented by any of these fine folks and want their contact information, you can go to the Alliance website and we'll share that with you shortly. Just wanted to put that out there very quickly. Um, Deontay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's fine. I was going to uh, ask Livio. Um, what is Livio, what is your call to action? Yeah, so I kind of wanted to also highlight that we got here in large part because of the protests. So as you think back, many of you back to the protests you may have participated in, when it was like the stand and the street with a sign, probably in the rain, and maybe you felt like that wasn't enough action. I just want to validate that, like that action, that's a big reason why we're here <laughs> because you did that, because you were out there. Um, and however, going forward, that is still helpful. But if you are itching for that more direct, way to connect that energy to change. Reaching out to your legis your representatives, your senators, that is the, the next step. Uh, and being persistent. It's not enough to, to just send one email, one postcard. You have to, like, as the session moves, things change, just stay on top of it, be persistent. Uh, respond, don't, don't spam, but <laughs> be, Re respond in a way that you think will generally be helpful. Uh, so that's a big that's a big one. Just echoing Rep. Johnson's call to action. Action. <laughs> um, I also want to highlight that it's been. I don't know how many of you know. Probably none of you know this off the top of your head. When was the last time Washington State ever, ever convicted a police officer of homicide? It was ninety. 1938. Oh, I'm sorry. So I used to say it was 82 years ago, but now that we're in the new year, I have to increment and say it's 83 years ago now. Um, and so we literally have had more convictions during the Jim Crow era than the modern era. And it and accountability, it, as we were just talking about with all these bills, it is a constellation. There are so many pieces that are broken and we are working on all of them. So that that is what it will take. It takes a lot of work, a lot of love, a lot of legislation and a lot of new ideas. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I would like to thank Senator Dingra as well as Senator Peterson as well as Representative Johnson and Livio and of course Sakar um, for all participating in in our Alliance chat today about accountability. Um, with closing, I just want to reach out to community and, and let you know, as, as well as you see here, our senators our, our, and our representatives for our community are here because they're here for you. We are here building the table and we are asking you all to come join us in this space. Below in the chat box, you will see the, uh, the Black Lives Matter Steering Committee Alliance uh, website. Please come check us out. Ask questions. We are here to show up for you. One thing about it is um, it makes one impact when you say that you'll be there because some certain people that go out there to Olympia, they're just there. But um, Senator Dinka, Dinkra, excuse me, um, Senator Peterson and Jesse Johnson are doing something with showing up. And we need to make sure that we're showing up for them. So please check out their policies as well. This is one of many conversations that this Alliance group will be having. If you have any ideas or thoughts on how you would like to be a part of the Alliance committee or, or join in on these policy conversations, please feel free to check out the website or the state reps um, information as well. Um, on the behalf of the representatives from BLM and myself uh, from BLM Steering Committee, Alliance Steering Committee. Um, I would like to thank you all for being here. Everyone, please stay safe, stay masked up, and be well. Thank you so much. Thank you.